Hi there, I'm Jim Zyron. Welcome back for more Conversations. To paraphrase Churchill, the American judicial system is the worst in the world, except for all the others. By far and large, our judges get it right, but occasionally they go off the rails, as they did in the recent case of SEC v. Lauer. David Dorson is back with us. David is a distinguished lawyer and legal biographer. He represented Michael Lauer, a hedge fund operator, in part of Lauer's unsuccessful 14-year struggle to achieve a measure of justice. David's book, Judicial Mayhem, chronicles the sad story of a litigation gone wrong, which ended with the incredible outcome that Lauer, acquitted of all wrongdoing by a Florida jury in a criminal case, was stripped of his assets in a civil case on virtually the same evidence, while the investor victims of the alleged fraud came out with virtually nothing. We're pleased to have David here to tell us all about it. Good afternoon, Jim. Well, the case is about parties, and parties are often human beings. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Michael Lauer and his background. Well, Michael Lauer is a fascinating man. He came to the United States at the age of 15 in 1971 from Poland. He spoke no English, had no money, came with his mother, neither of whom spoke English, and just descended on the United States and had the benefit of Simon Wiesenthal being a family friend. The Nazi hunter. The Nazi hunter, the famous Nazi hunter, whom, uh, who helped Lauer, but, and whom Lauer repaid, as he said, a thousand times over by contributing to his causes. He worked his way through college, wanted to join the CIA, was discouraged, and, and uh, Simon Wiesenthal said, why don't you consider finance? which was a shock to someone who came from the, behind the Iron Curtain. This was after a stint in the Marine Corps. Lauer was Absolutely in the Marine right. Corps. Absolutely right. He joined the Marine Corps. He was very, very gung-ho. He was, there were something like 50 people in his uh, class, and he came in second. But then he found that he had bad eyesight, or not sufficient eyesight, and couldn't go to uh, flight school and quit. Went, went to uh, join, he joined a couple of uh, substantial uh, financial firms, and then set out on his own to form hedge funds because he felt, as he put it, he said, I'm not terribly immodest, but I thought I could do pretty well in that company. So he became a hedge fund operator. So could you describe for us briefly the structure of his hedge funds? There was the Lancer Group. Tell us about that. Sure. Hedge funds are limited to very sophisticated investors who have a million dollars to invest. Lauer decided to make a small group of about a half a dozen or eight people who, uh, and he went out and solicited customers, starting with himself and, and including people like Morgan Stanley or entities like Morgan Stanley. So he was an investor himself? He was an investor himself and, and, and actually when he started, he had more money in it than anybody and actually he continued to have more money in his hedge funds than any individual. And at the end, how much was in the, the head fund, oh, hedge funds under management? About a billion dollars. Over a billion dollars, yep. uh, a substantial portion of which was Lauer's. And to get, probably jump ahead of ourselves, at the, by the end of the case, Lauer was left with nothing, not a penny, because they froze every dime and took every dime from him. And the investors lost 95% of their investment. The charge by the SEC was that Lauer inflated the investments that the hedge fund made. For example, a company that was starting up, Lauer might value at $10 million because of the prospects and the history of the people involved. The SEC said nothing, and the judges uniformly went with the SEC. They never once, the district judges never once ruled for Lauer, and over 140 times that I documented, they ruled against Lauer and for the SEC. Well, uh, why would he ever want to uh, overvalue the investments? I mean, I wish I could overvalue my investments. Well, the, the, the logic of the SEC, which was, the logic was not terrible, but the uh, interpretation was, the logic of the SEC was that Lauer and his companies, the Lancer Group, as you mentioned, made money by fees from the investors. They got 1 or 2 percent of the total and 20 percent of any increase in value of the funds. Oh, I see. So he hypes the, the value exactly. so he gets greater fees, according to the SEC. Now, these funds were offshore funds, weren't they? Two, the, two, the, the largest and the smallest, which were you know, like three quarters of a billion as opposed to a quarter of a billion, that was local. 
But it would make, first of all, it made no sense for Lauer to do this. By the, time, when, by the time he was accused of doing something wrong, he personally was worth over $100 million. They never, the SEC never explained how Lauer switched from an innocent, proper hedge fund manager to a crook. And the answer, to, again, to get ahead of ourselves was that one of the people who worked for him was the evil genius. Besides this, Lauer had over $40 million of his own money in the, in the hedge funds. So why would he do this when he could make much, even if he was the greatest crook in the world, he couldn't make $40 million from uh, his, his chican alleged chicanery. And the SEC never presented evidence that he did anything wrong. Now, the investments themselves, David, uh, were uh, largely enlisted companies, weren't they? Well, they, were, they, they covered the full range. Uh, hedge funds can operate any one of a number of ways. Some of them deal in monetary uh, currencies. Others sell short. Lauer did everything, but mostly bought in both small un new startups and in major investments. A uh, hundred million dollars or so at least was in the New York Stock Exchange companies, where obviously he didn't um, manipulate the stock and was perfectly honest. And nevertheless, a judge found federal judge from Florida, that every dime that Lauer earned was dishonest. It, you know, they were, they were you know, ignoring the facts in a way that made me cringe. Well, let's just look at that for a minute. Uh, how much uh, of uh, what was eventually seized by uh, the receiver with court approval, how much was uh, in uh, so-called ill-gotten gain and how much was uh, Lauer's uh, before the alleged fraud began? Well, by the t at the end of the case, the uh, district judge, federal district judge, found that Lauer had, def had uh, gotten $42 million out of a billion in uh, ill-gotten gains. Nevertheless, the amount that went to investors, including Lauer, who got nothing, that the investors got 5%, so that the investors got something like $50 million and $950 million just went into thin air and or was taken by the receiver. Fees for the receiver and the receiver's lawyer and uh, the accountants for the receiver and... That's uh, exactly right, that's uh, exactly right. Well, let whole, me just mention one thing too. All too. array of professionals. That's right. The way it worked normally is that a person is found guilty and then when uh, they, they hire a receiver to distribute the money. Here they did something very, very unusual. They appointed a receiver when they filed the case, the SEC filed the case, and a receiver was supposed to be neutral arm of the court, but instead was working hand in glove with the SEC. And amazingly, and this is sometimes hard to follow, the SEC sued the management companies and Lauer on behalf of the investors. He appointed a receiver for the hedge funds. Which were not defendants. They were not defendants, and they were the victims. And they were the victims. It's just, you know, I, mean, I could go on. Uh, now, also, time. the hedge funds, uh, which were uh, British Virgin Islands yes, companies. Yes, exactly, mostly. Uh, the, the hedge funds had an independent board of directors, right? Exactly, elected. They, they were responsible for setting the values, isn't that right? Exactly. So, I mean, Lauer could say to them, um, we want you to inflate the values, and they would have probably told him to go to hell. Uh, that's why they were there. They're the right. watchdog directors. Well, and besides that, the accounting firm that certified his hedge fund values was Price Waterhouse Coopers, which is one of the top companies in, in, in the business and never withdrew its certification for Lauer. One other thing, as bad as they, what they did by putting a receiver in charge of the victims, they appointed the same receiver for the uh, hedge funds, the uh, management funds and for, that Lauer managed. So in effect, you had one receiver, one individual representing both the victims and the perpetrators. Okay, so you pointed to two gross violations of the Constitution, right. haven't you? Number one, there was a seizure without notice or hearing right. uh, first. And uh, number two, uh, there was an abridgment of his right to counsel. Exactly. He never had a lawyer. Worse than that. I mean, it, I mean until you came in much later. I came in in 2012 when he was sued in 2003. By the time I came in, there was a judgment against him for $62 million and growing. And I did what I could to rescue him, 
but I'm sorry to say, and I'm sure he's sorry to say, that I wasn't successful. Now, was there ever a trial on the merits? Oh, you're, you're, you're hitting the right buttons. Well, that's why I'm here. Yeah. Well, what they did was this. Normally, uh, there's a pretrial discovery, and then there's a trial. In this case, bizarrely, the SEC moved for summary judgment, which is a procedure that is employed when there are no outstanding issues of fact. And isn't it very rare that in a fraud case, uh, the court grants summary judgment for the plaintiff, wh where there are issues of uh, what lawyers call cyanide, which is intent to defraud, and uh, issues of materiality, whether whatever the statements were made were important. Uh, it's a very, very unusual to uh, uh, sort of draw the curtain to a close before the, the play has even begun. That's right. And when Lauer, who was by himself without a lawyer, the SEC would take depositions of various people, victim, alleged uh, victims, alleged uh, owners of companies and things like that, and Lauer would cross-examine them. La Michael Lauer is very, very smart. And he brought out... There's no legal training. No legal training. He didn't even <laughs> have a civics class. <laughs> they don't have civics classes in Poland. Right. And Lauer was not, obviously not a lawyer, and it was not a matter of choice. And in fact, at one point, the judge, one of the judges wanted to appoint him to represent the hedge funds, mm -hmm. even though he was accused of <laughs> stealing from the hedge funds. He was not a lawyer. And you know, the, the, the case is, is really bizarre. I have never seen anything remotely like it in my 60 years plus of practice. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the judges. You, you first, you uh, had a judge with an unpronounceable name, Zlock. Zlock, right. Okay. And uh, Zlock was the one who uh, authorized ex party, that means with Lauer not being present, authorized the, the seizure. And uh, then they, appointed a receiver who was a litigator, right. uh, wasn't a financial guy, and uh, so there was a sort of an omnibus receiver for all the assets in sight, and uh, left Lauer without any funds to either to support his family or to uh, exactly. uh, retain counsel. And keep in mind, this is a hedge fund. This is all shocking. It is shocking, <laughs> and it's a hedge fund where you have to watch the stocks minute by minute. When they appointed a receiver, from Miami, by the way, and it's a long oh, story. Oh, yeah, why they brought it there. His they operations never, were in New York. Right? They never showed one bit of evidence that his hedge fund did business in Florida or have followed a customer. And uh, mm. it, it, it was just, um, just, just incredible. And the, uh, the receiver, when he was appointed, he next day he has a raid on the hedge funds in Manhattan and uh, Greenwich, Connecticut, or Stanford, Connecticut, and then takes all the records, moves them to Florida, and for three or four months never looked at the investments of, in the stock portfolio, and ultimately sells them all off, even the ones on the New York Stock Exchange, at bargain and fire sale prices, including to people who, in, in some cases, could not legally own this stock because they were insiders. You know, it is such a litany of, of misconduct that one thing that amazes me is this, that I published the book and I, 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 stated, I was sitting by the phone waiting for the SEC to call me and say what's got, what went on here, waiting for some judicial body to call me and his utter silence. No one cares about these things. You could write a book uh, and a book and a book and a book and no one pays attention to it, that matters. And I just don't, I, I just can't accept that. It's interesting, and, and, and as I remember it, it's been a while, but uh, if you move for summary judgment, you have to give the court a statement of uh, what you think the uh, issues uh, are that uh, can, uh, are not triable. Right. Uh, the issues where there's no uh, ch uh, issue of fact. Uh, and the other side gives a statement of the issues that are supposed to be tried. Now here, uh, the SEC presented a, a long statement of uh, uh, the issues that they said uh, were not triable, and the judge just adopted those, including typos. He uh, scanned, he, as he, lawyers say, in high verbum, in very, the very words. They scanned on a, on a, on a computer. He, he, the judge, <laughs> Kenneth Maurer, scanned the SEC submission, which was filed before Lauer responded, incidentally, with all his evidence, and 
scanned typos and all, and that he put his name to it. And to me, that is bizarre. And as you said, the SEC was the, the motion was incredible because it was 30 plus or well, 30 pages of detail. One of the facts that the SEC claim was not in dispute and material was that Lauer had defrauded the Internal Revenue Service of $21 million. No evidence, not a shred. Material? How is that material? Undisputed? It's ridiculous. I mean, this was typical. Uh, maybe that was an extreme case, but there was case after case where they distorted the evidence and no one seemed to pay attention. And then, of course, but I got into the case after the judgment of $42 million plus $19 million in pre-judgment interest was awarded against Lauer to the SEC. And if I may, interest is usually awarded pre-judgment when a person has money. <laughs> has the he, use of the money. Has use of the money that he stole from somebody else. But here, Lauer was deprived of the money. And Lauer screamed to, to his credit. He did a remarkable job for someone who was not a lawyer. I came and I screamed bloody murder. And the Court of Appeals to the 11th Circuit did nothing. Okay, so before we get to the 11th Circuit, uh, while Lauer is uh, generating his response to the SEC, uh, trying to show that there are tribal issues, he's, uh, meanwhile, he was indicted on the same evidence exactly. in a criminal case. And acquitted. And in the criminal case, because uh, the Supreme Court says the Constitution entitles an indigent defendant to a lawyer, he had an appointed counsel, didn't he? Yes, he did. Who had no experience in this kind of case, well, he but who won the case. Yes. And he, he was acquitted. He was acquitted. He tried to hire a, a real pro lawyer, hmm. but he couldn't because the judge, uh, Mara, would not release the money. So he was absolutely penniless, even though he was entitled to some of the money. The only lawyer he could find was a public defender, Michael Caruso, to his credit, he had had one SEC case in his long career, and he got a, a, an acquittal. I mean, unbelievably. And if Lauer had been convicted, he probably would have gone to prison for the rest of his life. Probably. The, the uh, guidelines were to something like 20 to 30 years because of the tens of millions of dollars allegedly involved. And it was, as his lawyer said, sometimes you bet the farm, here you're betting your life. And Lauer said, I'm, I'm with you, let's go. Okay, so you take this uh, case up to the 11th Circuit. The 11th Circuit's gotten a lot of publicity recently yes. uh, uh, because uh, they, uh, uh, with the appellate court in uh, Judge Cannon's uh, order appointing a special master on right. the Mar-a-Lago documents, and uh, recently they vindicated themselves by uh, uh, standing up to Trump and uh, reversing uh, the district judge in... Uh, her order in its entirety. So, uh, and the chief judge uh, of the Eleventh Circuit is uh, Judge uh, uh, Pryor, William Pryor, uh, William Pryor, and he sat in your case, didn't he? He sat on the after. Well, actually, we went up. I went up to the, uh, the Lauer went up the Eleventh Circuit a couple of times before he found me, and I went up a half a dozen times after he found me, claiming all sorts of violations by the district court, including bias and and, and uh, depriving him of an attorney and things like that. Is it evidence of bias if uh, in a case you make 29 motions and they're all denied? 140. 140, 140 motions. 140 motions, yes. Well, that, we, we didn't even, I didn't even argue that because <laughs> I couldn't prove you know, each, each one, but he had made statements and had, when there was an, uh, one motion by Lauer to, to disqualify the judge. The judge, who was supposed to be impartial, went out and acquired an affidavit from a court clerk saying that he did nothing wrong, even though the court clerk had no idea what was going on. He wasn't even there when the conduct of the question, namely the selection of Mara, uh, was made. And I uh, try to make that the subject of a motion. I made it the subject of a motion, and it was never heard. The 11th Circuit just refused to deal with the merits. When I filed the motion, they would say just the word denied. When the case was over, they dismissed it on their own motion. And this is important because originally this, the 11th Circuit decided, purportedly decided to affirm the judgment of the district court in, 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 a, in a despicable opinion. It was just, they, they praised Judge uh, Maurer's 
um, opinion on summary judgment when he had scanned the <laughs> ridiculous SEC motion. And, and then, there were controverted issues of well, fact there, without question. People were saying he was innocent. I mean, the, the, the directors filed affidavits, the employees filed affidavits, the traders, because they accused Lauer of making trades by fixing the amounts. But he couldn't do that because he, he had no traders in his outfit. He had to go to an independent licensed company, which in turn had to go to the maker of the stock, market, uh, maker. Mark, market maker, and they all said nothing went, was, was wrong. And one of the people uh, who was accused of helping Lauer was indicted and acquitted. So it, it, is, it is bizarre. I mean, it is, it is so outrageous that it is very difficult for me to talk about it in a normal tone and in a normal... Well, when you got into the case, uh, did you make any effort to contact the SEC and uh, say, what in the hell are you well, doing here? Well, actually, Lauer, uh, again, he filed a long letter to the Inspector General of the SEC complaining about all of these things. And the SEC's response is, well, the case is before judges. Mm -hmm. Nothing we can do. It's in do litigation. It's in litigation. Litigation. Right. So. And once you lose, you've <laughs> lost, so how can you complain? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a catch-22 situation. I was uh, struck by the fact that, first place, a lot of these uh, adverse uh, orders uh, against Lauer uh, there was no reasoning, no opinion offered. Uh, exactly. uh, no one knows how they got there. It was just sort of like... And, but, but that's what they were doing, and they did it because they could do that. You can do that on motions. You can't do that on a direct appeal. So it was just the word denied, or we filed a motion uh, for mandamus, which is a special proceeding that requires a certain... Uh, allegations, and they said he, the allegations were not sufficient or denied. It, it, it was... You know, it's really terrible, and I, I really hope somebody in the government or someplace takes a close look at it. I also uh, was struck by the fact that where uh, they did try to uh, offer some reasoning, uh, it was mainly on procedural grounds that uh, it's out of time, it's, uh, you didn't raise it below, and in fact he did. Uh, you, uh, this is not appropriate for direct appeal. Uh, all sorts of uh, procedural devices uh, to defeat uh, his uh, position, or else they just ignored his positions, which seemed to me, many of them, uh, were uh, uh, extremely convincing. Well, uh, one thing I didn't mention is that um, for, for, to get s some attention for the book, out of my own pocket, I paid to have copies sent to every active Court of Appeals judge and to the chief judge of all 87, I think, district courts. And I got one letter saying, thank you very much for your book. Mm -hmm. One of them saying, thank you very much for your book. I put it in the library so that all judges can hear it. <laughs> Otherwise, silence. It, it, it is scary. So I want, first I wanted to ask you, what was the, the fundamental error here committed by the courts? And you have two district judges and you have uh, a host of appellate judges. Well, to say there's a fundamental error in this book, <laughs> there are a lot of fundamental errors. But what would you say was the main thing that went wrong? This is the case that went wrong. There was a, a play called The Play That Went Wrong. I think the fundamental thing was not realizing that the, district, that the SEC had no case, that Lauer was entitled to a lawyer, that he was entitled to due process, that judges have to exert themselves and try to get to the bottom of it. And in this case, the two district judges, uh, Zlock and Maurer, they, they just agreed with Lauer. And in fact, in one case, a judge held Lauer in contempt because he could not meet the extraordinary d discovery demands that the SEC was imposing on him. So they kept saying, tell us this, tell us that. And he said, I don't have the documents. I can't do it. I'm, I'm all by myself. Tell us this, tell us that. And finally, the judge held him in contempt. And as a sanction, they said, if there's a trial, you can't testify, mm. and if there's a summary judgment, you can't present any evidence, uh, any new, you can't present your own testimony or the testimony of anybody not used by the SEC. They, they muzzled him. They so muzzled I have him. a question for you, because unfortunately we've run out of time, oh. and this is a fascinating yeah. subject. But uh, David Dawson, uh, after you were involved in this case, and after you, the marvelous research you did into what happened before you got into the case, and, and this book that uh, uh, tries to explain what is obviously a miscarriage of justice, uh, with all that you did, have you lost faith in our judicial system? 
Um, no, basically no, but I recognize that there are serious deficiencies in the system, and particularly uh, district judges normally get a review by the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals judges are essentially not subject to review because 1% of the cases or less than 1% go to the Supreme Court. And I think the media and everybody has to pay attention to individual cases when it's brought to their attention. And it, it, it's, it's, it's so sad that this could happen. Some people lost much of their money uh, and uh, you know, have still not recovered. It's tragic. It is tragic. So uh, I hope they'll pay attention to your book, and I hope they'll pay attention to the case of uh, Michael really, Lauer. Not many lawyers write books about cases they lose. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a glutton for punishment. I am, indeed. <laughs> so, David Dorson, thank you so much for coming well, by. Thank you for having thank me. Thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Meanwhile, take care, be well, and all the best.